What manner of man is this? We've been basing this series on Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25, where Jesus was in the storm. And when he calmed the storm, his disciples were amazed. And they, being afraid, wondered, saying to one another, What manner of man is this? For he even commands the winds and the water, and they obey him. So we're looking at their question. They asked, What manner of man is this? Let's pray. Father, we pray today as we look in your word and we look at what Jesus did and how it all worked, that you would give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him and that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, that we might understand and comprehend what you're showing us, the things that are freely given to us, that we can have a greater and greater revelation of you, of Jesus, and of exactly what your characteristics are in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray also that you would help us to be able to apply this to our lives, that we can not only be hearers of the word, but that we can be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're asking the question, what manner of man is Jesus? Number four, he is absolutely good. This is also something we need as the foundational fundamental, rock-solid understanding of who God is. We need to understand that God is love, God is good, before we unpack things like God is justice and God is a judge. We need to understand that everything about God is for good. That's why Jesus said, the thief came to steal, to kill and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Why? Because God is good. Now, this comes up in Jesus' life when the person called the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And it says this in Mark chapter 10, 17 and 18. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. In other words, you could say it like this. Jesus was amazed. He could have said, I know you're a good Jewish boy, and I know that you have been taught thoroughly, and you're grounded in the fact that there is only one good person and that is God. God is good. You've had that. It's in the Psalms, and I'll show that in a minute. Therefore, when he says, good teacher, he seems to be confessing his faith that Jesus is God. See, why do you call me good? No one's good but one, that is God. In other words, if you're calling me good, you must be thinking that I am God. That was an amazing start to the conversation with the rich young ruler. The problem was he had other gods in his life and one of them was his wealth and he wouldn't yield over serving that God to serve Jesus exclusively in any way sad and upset. Now, think about this. Good teacher. Listen to what Psalm 25 verse 8 says. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore. Now, therefore is what follows on from the fact that God is good and upright. God is good and upright, so he teaches sinners in the way. God is good, so he teaches. Amen. God is upright, so he teaches. And he teaches sinners in the way. Therefore, learning from God is a privilege. This is said again in Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. It's amazing that teaching goes with God's goodness. It's because he's good that we can learn from God. If he wasn't, he might leave us in darkness, unenlightened and untaught in the truth. That would be extremely sad. God is good. God is good. Now, it also says this in James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation 
or shadow of turning. What are good gifts? They come from God. He is good. He gives good gifts. Well, I just thought about this today and I thought this. If you go back to the book of Genesis, this is what happened right at the beginning. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. So if God's giving good gifts, it certainly includes light. And then he went on and he made the water and he made the separation between the water above and the water below and the sea and all that. And again, it says, God saw that it was good. So air, light, water, all of these things are good. They're gifts from above. Salvation is a gift from God that is good. And every other good thing is coming down from God. Good gifts, perfect gifts come from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, not a shadow of turning. Remember again, the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's goodness in operation. That's God's love. That's who God is. Amen. Years ago, Oral Roberts had that message. God is a good God. And he used to say something good is going to happen to you today. It was controversial when he brought it out. But we still have to renew our minds to it. God is good. Now, for an illustration, think about this. I've never had children, but I've observed parents. I do have parents. My sister has children and I've watched and I've tried to understand. And I guess you listening today, you may already have children and you would know that a loving parent, when a child is born, they think about the good, what that person will become, what good things they can do. I'm going to provide. I'm going to look after you. I'll get up in the night. I will do good things for you. I will love you and do you good all the days of your life. What kind of a parent would it be that saw the new baby and said, I can't wait to discipline him. I can't wait to judge him. I can't wait to correct him. I'm going to spend the next 21 years thinking of new ways to punish him. That's not a good parent. That's a really, really seriously bad description of a parent, and that is child abuse. Amen. What about the parent that would say, I'm going to teach this kid something. I'm going to put cancer on him as soon as I can. I'm going to get him stung with bees, break his legs. That's not a good parent. Again, that would be absolute child abuse. And so when we realize that God is good, God is love, we can't possibly conceive of him doing things like that to his children. Amen. Now, those that aren't his children haven't come under the protection of redemption, and they're still subject to the curse. The curse is out there because Adam and Eve gave over the control of the world to the devil and the control of the human race. We had to be redeemed from that by Jesus, which we received by faith. Remember, we read after John 3.16 that God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but those that believe in him might be saved. We have to believe in God, come under the umbrella of his protection. Remember, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Those that love God, submit to God, worship God in spirit and truth, those that are led by the Spirit, live by faith, follow the love way, they are protected by God from the curse. It might take a lot of faith in God's word to achieve the full benefits of this, but that's who it's for and that's how it works. God is not sending the curse on those outside. By staying outside of his covering, they're in the devil's world system and they're where the curse operates. God doesn't want them out there. That's why he sent Jesus. He's not sending the curse on them. The devil brought that on them when he took over control of the world. God is finding a way to rescue them from that because God is love and God is good. Amen. Now, remember, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, 
not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So even bringing people out of the kingdom of darkness, receiving the new birth and coming under the rulership of Jesus, it's the goodness of God that leads them to this. Amen. So what manner of man is Jesus? He's Lord over storms with his word. He's the living word of God. He's pure love. And as we've just seen, he is absolutely good. Having seen this, we go to number five, that he is perfect justice. I'm going to read a section out of Psalm 37 to get to the part I want to read. But it's all very good and we need to really take this on board. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herbs. Trust in the Lord. I mean, you can't get it any straighter than that, can you? Do good. Why? Because we're his children. We imitate him. Then it says dwell. Note that. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because he's good. He's loving. He loves you and wants you to have the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. In other words, don't take off on independent journeys because they can take you out from being under the shelter of of his wings. Amen. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Verse 27 goes straight on to say, depart from evil and do good. That's very clear, isn't it? Depart from evil and do good, and then dwell forevermore. So this dwelling and abiding with God is connected to departing from evil and doing good. And it's also showing us that evil and good are opposites. You have to depart from that direction to go to this direction. They're opposite directions. Verse 28, For the Lord loves justice. God loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Amen. So let's come back to this now. God loves justice. So having fully grasped and understood that the foundation of who God is, is love and goodness, then when we look at his justice, we realize what motivates it. God created humans and angels with free will. Their free will, they can choose what they do. Having done that, it's only right and just that God would hold people to account for their actions. If our actions are not accountable and do not produce outcomes, then they're not significant. But our choices and our decisions have eternal significance. They last forever. That's why there has to be eternal rewards. And for those that have perpetrated evil, lived without love and hurt others, there has to be eternal condemnation, judgment or punishment. Anything less would be to trivialize the power of human free will and choice. It's because God is good and because he is there to protect the innocent and that he loves his children, that God also has to love justice and bring evildoers to account. These things are not contrary to love. It's part of love's expression. It's like the parents who dream great things for their child, and they get up and they love the child and look after the child and pray for them and provide for them and believe for them to grow. At times, they have to correct, admonish them, and train them how to become what God has planned for them. But at the same time, anybody else that comes in here and tries to do unloving acts against them, the parents will step in and stop it if they can. Amen. God loves justice. 
You can't have someone going around doing evil to good people. They need to be accountable and brought to justice. Amen. Now, as part of this, the Bible clearly says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11, that we all, underline and note the word all, we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's read this. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Well, good is on that side. Whether good or bad or evil. Remember, stop doing evil, do good. God wants us to do good and he's released his Holy Spirit and the word of God and new birth and given us everything we need to be able to do the good. You could summarize that as the grace of God. God's grace enables us to do good. If you didn't follow that, I've got a book entitled Sweatless Holiness that teaches on all of these principles. Amen. And you can find all my books on online sellers like Amazon, Lulu, Barnes & Noble, and all the regular online booksellers. Or you can write to us and we'll arrange to get you a copy. God bless you. Now, it says this. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for the things we've done, whether good or bad. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, the point here is, if you're living right, you're born again, confessing Jesus is Lord, putting your full faith in him, confessing if you need to confess sin, you know, we do at the beginning, we confess our whole life is wrong, we receive the new birth, we continue going along. But then it says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. Obviously, there's things you do wrong, you don't even know you did wrong. But if it's bothering your conscience, you confess it to God, receive forgiveness, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We walk like this with God in holiness. We worship him in spirit and in truth, live by faith, led by the spirit. We stay in love with God. We don't let our love run cold. We love others. They'll know you're disciples of Jesus by your love. And as we're doing that, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, there is no terror in it because you'll be rewarded for the things that you've done in your life the good things, and if you've done any bad things, they're confessed, they're washed by the blood of Jesus, God forgot them, and then you go on to eternal rewards. But if you walk away from Jesus, walk away, try to renounce him, and then you appear before there, then you have things that you've done that you have to give an account for. Amen. That could be a very scary moment. That's why Paul says, we go around persuading people to get their lives right with God because he's fully aware of what it would be like to stand before God having walked independently of God and done things against God and against others, breaking love and goodness. Amen. Then, you know, the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment could be very scary. Amen. So what manner of man is Jesus today? We've seen that he's pure love. He's absolutely good and he's perfect justice. Amen. You know, in the courts today, I'll never forget this. I admit I watched a TV program at the end of which justice wasn't done. And the, one of the lawyers protested. He said, but this is not justice. And the judge says, I didn't promise you justice. I promised you a fair trial. So we call it loosely the justice system, but true justice even though it may not always be found in the courts, it will certainly be found at the judgment seat of Christ and at the great white throne. It will be found at the glorious throne when Jesus judges the nations. Some are sheep nations, some are goat nations. All nations will be gathered to him. Praise God. What manner of man is he? Number six, he is patient and long-suffering. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 to 15. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 
So some people think, well, come on, God, it's time to judge these people. No, God is saying, I'm trusting, I'm believing, I'm hoping that they're going to repent. He's giving time, giving as much time as he can, even though some of his own children are suffering. He's giving time because love hardly notices when others do it wrong, but love also is loyal to his children. So where children have been mistreated, and we just had it on our news here, that one preacher, somebody attacked him in the pulpit and knifed him, that's unjust. That's one of God's kids being hurt. And this person will be brought to justice unless they repent and give their life over to Jesus. And then even a sin like that is washed away. Amen. So Peter says this, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Now I'm going to read now verse 15 of this passage. It's part of 2 Peter chapter 3. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. God's given you time up till now. He's been waiting for you for this moment. If you haven't been saved, you haven't received his new birth, then he wants you to do it today. And doing it really is quite simple. He's done everything he can to prepare this to make it easy for you. You begin the life of Jesus by simply turning from that old life, confessing that you were a sinner, that it was wrong. You turn to Jesus. You acknowledge that he died on the cross to pay for your sin and three days later rose from the dead, demonstrating that the forgiveness of sin is now possible. You receive Jesus as your saviour. You confess him as your Lord and you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit and begin to follow the good shepherd's voice in Jesus' name. Then Jesus promises you'll be born again. Something is going to happen inside. You might not see the change outside apart from starting to smile and be happy. But on the inside, you'll be changed. Your past is forgiven, cleansed, washed away. You go out from the devil's kingdom, straight into God's kingdom, and then you begin the life of following him. So if you want this today, you want to be born again into God's kingdom, then simply repeat the prayer I'm about to pray. This is for you. So say this after me. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I was a sinner. I turn from my life of sin. I turn to you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess that you are now my Lord. I receive your new birth. Thank you that my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, Jesus is Lord. I'm led by the Spirit and I'm following the Good Shepherd's voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, I believe you're born again. Something amazing just take place in you right now. You are a new creation. All the old stuff's gone. You've got a brand new start today. Just like a new baby starts without any record of sin or wrong, you start that way right now. And if you do anything wrong or you'd slip up in any way, you just ask, God, please forgive me. I was wrong. Don't try to justify it. You just ask for forgiveness, confess it, and then forget it. And keep following Jesus. Amen. A good way to follow Jesus, of course, is to stay in the Word of God, read the Bible, listen to these messages. I have daily Bible studies every day except Sunday on the Internet, on Facebook. And they're there for you to read. And every other viewer today, too, you can read my studies. My books are available. They're under David W. Palmer on Lulu, Amazon, and other good sellers on the internet. So I encourage you, keep following Jesus and get with other believers. Have some time with them. Make good friends that are good Christians and turn from evil 
and have nothing more to do with it. Amen. Then you can grow in doing things like being good, loving others, following the Holy Spirit and learning how to lead others to Jesus as well. God bless you today. Thank you so much for listening.